I watched a young soldier take his seat on the plane. And the guy by the window said, My name is Kirk Borger. I am the library director at the Riverview Public Library. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd. Today we have uh, Mr. Don Hatfield. He's a longtime Riverview resident and he served in the United States Army Air Corps and later the United States Air Force. He enlisted in 1947 and was discharged in 1960, am I correct? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, first, I'm just going to ask some uh, questions um, about, just so we can get a better sense of who you are. Uh, where and where were you born? Crab Orchard, Kentucky, 1930. And what were your parents, oh, just by the way, where is Crab Orchard, Kentucky? It's... Uh, right near Stanford, Kentucky, which is a bigger city, and that is probably 75 miles due uh, south, southeast of, uh, I'm trying to think, Lexington. Lexington. Right. Okay. When did you move up here to Riverview? Well, I came to Michigan when I was only three months old by way oh, of my parents. And then when I moved to Riverview, it was uh, in the late 60s. My brother Jim had already bought a house and lived in Riverview, so our family decided we wanted to live in this area. So I've been here since the late 60s. And what were your parents' occupations? Well, back then, it, they were just horse farmers. And uh, it, it was when I was three months old, my mother and uncles, aunts, quite a few, at least half a dozen of them migrated to Michigan. So I've been actually a Michigan resident since I was six months old. And uh, the family then, my mother went to work for uh, Timken Axel, they call it in Detroit, near where we lived. By, it was down on Ford Street from Clark's Park. And uh, she worked there until she retired and uh, I was raised by my mother alone, and I had a brother lived with us and an older brother until he got married, moved out, and my brother that was two years old, two years older than me, and then uh, when he got married, moved out, it was about time for me, I went in the service at 17. And what high school did you go to? Western High, over by Clark Park, that's on the west side of Detroit, Michigan. And so you were a high school student before you entered the military. Exactly. And you enlisted. I enlisted when I was only 17, had to get my mother's signature. And the hardest part about that was to get her signature, and my older brother talked her into it, a 15-year-older one. He says, look, Mom, he's going to be 18, uh, 11 more months. He'll enlist anyway, and you can't stop him. So why don't you just let him go and let him grow up? What year did you graduate? Uh, I left there when I was only 17, enlisted in the service, and I did not graduate. I got my GED in the service, in fact. So you enlisted. How, how did you choose the U.S. Army Air Corps? Uh, going up the steps, bumped into a man dressed in an Army uniform and says, are you on your way to enlist? How I ever knew, I guess just because of my age. Uh, I told him, yes, I am. I'm going to enlist in the Navy. He says, why do you want to do that? Don't you like airplanes? I says, I love them. I got aircraft I built at home. Uh, back in those days, as a lot of kids did, boys growing up, you built model airplanes out of wood and banana skin oil and all that stuff. And he says, well, you'd fit right in. We could get you on the aircraft, let you work on them, whatever you want to do, blah, blah, blah. And he went on and on. And he finally convinced me, but that's better than sailing around in the ocean on this tin ship, so you might as well do this. And so he convinced me, and I did join the Army Air Corps. So you think you made the right choice? Oh, uh, positively. No <laughs> doubt. Uh, were any of your uh, family members in the military? Oh, quite a few of them. In fact, most of, all I can think of, down to cousins. I had a lot of cousins because my mother came from a large family of 12. There was 12 sisters and brothers on her side, and uh, most of them became, uh, most of them I can think of were 
in the service. All the uncles, the cousins, all the cousins I can think of, there was a lot of them. And when they were of age, they were all in the service. So yes, a lot of military in the family. Mm, where did you do your basic training before you were? Amarillo, shipping? Texas. It was, uh, they had a Air Corps base there, uh, right at Amarillo. And that's where it was. They took you through your basic there. Then when you're done with basic, uh, I went to a special school. And uh, after that specializing school, they shipped me out to the occupation forces, World War II of Japan occupation force. So do you think the physical exercise was probably the, the most difficult part of the, the basic training? They had a real good system set up there. It was either make you or break you. And uh, the drill sergeants, they tried to do their best, and I'm sure they did, because they were trying to get you ready for anything you might run up against. And they seemed to pick on some people more than the other if they weren't in physical shape. And then when they gave you push-ups, every morning they'd fall you out in the wee hours of the morning you had to go out and do calisthenics. And some of the guys were just starting to get in shape. By the time they got out of basic training, they were quite in shape. They lost a lot of pounds, the ones that came in a little overweight. I was fortunate. I probably weighed the same now as I did when I went into service. So I, I'm just fortunate. So the, did, did the drill instructors pick on you? No. In fact, uh, out of basic, if you kept your nose clean and done what the dr drill sergeant expected of you, you get a first stripe. You'd earn your first stripe right out of basic PFC. So I was one of the forger ones. I got my stripe right out of basic training. So I guess I must have done something right. Well, because you had mentioned you had played some sports yeah, beforehand. Yeah, and I've been active all my life as a youngster growing up. Uh, I was on a couple of swim teams at the YMC and I played football and basketball. Did you play any sports while you were in the military? Yeah, a lot. I played uh, on an Air Force team that went and played Nile Kinnick Stadium in Tokyo and ended up winning a Far East Championship. We played all different uh, it didn't matter whether it was Army, Marines, Navy, anybody had a football team in the Far East, we would compete with them. And that was very good. What, el what else did you do for recreation well, when you were in the Army? Well, uh, we'd go to the rec hall and have uh, some of the Hollywood stars would come over to entertain us or visit us and just, you know, cheer us up for because uh, they all knew we was away from home doing something, you know, for your country and all that. So they, they were quite nice. A real old timer I'd like to mention, but uh, younger people probably never heard of him, William Demerst. He was a great, great guy in his time, and he really showed a lot of appreciation to veterans. He'd come around, and people in the service, he'd come around and do his best. To, he was comedian-like, and he'd come off some good ones. Did you have any specialized service? I mean, specialized training, I'm sorry. Yes, it was. Uh, uh, the one part, they gave us some desert survival training and then they took and decided by the test I had took that I would be better off in the line of aircraft. So they put me into a school called, it was called back then in the 40s, they called them sheet metal schools. Uh, the fuselage all aircraft and the wings are all built of metal. So they called you sheet metal men. But uh, then they later qualified as aircraft, uh, aircraft body structure repairmen. They, they just changed the name, but it all meant the same. So if aircraft needed repair after it came home from battle, you had to fix it up so it'd be ready for flight. Some were worse, some were quick fixes, some were weak, some were even longer than a week, depending on how bad they were shot up or they belly landed and they had the whole bottom to fix wings, everything. So it depends how bad they got damaged in their actual flights. Did the specialized training carry over into your civilian life when you were discharged in 1960? Yes, it did. Uh, I worked for the Apollo uh, North American Company 
North American Aircraft was a big aircraft company in World War II. They made a lot of uh, aircraft that were used in World War II, but then they went into the building of the Apollo, the command module and the service module and all them that were built. And uh, they had a contract to build, I think it was a total of three their contract was to make. And by the time they got to the third uh, command module and service module, they were gonna start laying off people. That's exactly why aircraft to me got a little tiresome because I was bouncing from job to job. I worked for Howard Hughes after that, only a year and he laid me off. Then I went to work for Bell Helicopter, but the advantage of going to work for Bell Helicopter was they were working out of Amarillo, Texas, repairing aircraft to send back into the Vietnam War. And that was halfway home to Michigan. So I thought to myself, well, I'll take that job. And then when they get ready to lay me off, I'm halfway home. They paid for shipping all my furniture. They paid me a bonus for signing up. And they paid me travel expenses to get there. So they paid half my way home. <laughs> So I'm guessing it didn't take you a long time to find a job after you were discharged. No, after I was discharged, it wasn't even a month I was working. It was less than a month, I'm sure. And I I'm guessing lucky. you were pretty happy about that as Very well. Very happy because uh, I thought I'd end up staying working in aircraft all my life, but then when I found out how the government contracts go and the people run out of work where you go <laughs> and looking for another job, I got tired of bouncing around, so I decided to come back to Michigan, and I came back to Michigan, been here ever since. Did you get married after this, after you uh, were in the service? Yeah, well, when I came back to Michigan, I did. Okay. Uh, I've been here since, well, I've been married for 43 years to my wife. I came home, and uh, I met her right after I came home, so I've been here since the early 60s. Let's go back to some of the experiences you had overseas. Uh, you were in the Army of Occupation with Japan. Right. That was in 1947. The war had ended in 1945. Right. So did you see any of uh, the destruction or the rebuilding that it, it had been done in Japan during the time that you were there? The city I was in had no signs of any war. But if you went to the Hiroshima where they dropped a bomb, one of the atomic bombs, and uh, they took us on a tour, which you had a volunteer to go on. It, somebody didn't want to see it, didn't have to go. But they kept you way away from it and up high where you could view, look down on it. And uh, you was no danger of radiation. You was so far back. And let me tell you, if you ever seen rubble like that, there's no way you'd ever want to be in a situation and go look at a city your family lived in and see it like that because it was total destruction. There was nothing left but rubble. Did you, while you were in Japan, did you have any interactions with the Japanese people? Or yes, in fact, well, the there? Japanese people were very good. In fact, uh, they were very polite and courteous to us. Uh, in fact, on some occasions you'd walk in one of the merchant stores, they bow down to you and everything else and invite you in and treat you really good. They, uh, I learned some Japanese quite a bit, in fact, but I don't speak it very much anymore because uh, after you don't use it, you lose it. So I still know a few words and that's it. How did you learn the Japanese? I had a lady instructor, if you wanted to go learn Japanese, uh, this very nice young lady. She was born and raised in Japan, but she spoke perfect English. And she had a job on the base, in fact, a secretarial job. She did work on the base as a secretary. So she was teaching Japanese classes. Don't ever try to learn to read your <laughs> symbols. I didn't want to go there. But uh, I was willing to learn the language. And I'd done real good at it at the time, but I left there I haven't been in Japan since the 50s, I left. And, uh, you know, you, you don't use the language, you soon, I can speak a little, but not enough to hold a, hold a good conversation like were I Were the used. Japanese people that you met, that you used the language with, were they impressed? That they were, you... yes, I got a couple compliments from one, one particular guy in a store I was bickering with about prices. 
asked me where I learned to speak Japanese, and I told him, and he says, she's done very well. Your accent is really good. So he was impressed with my Japanese accent. Now, I'm guessing your experience in Korea was a lot different than in Japan because you had a war going on in Korea at the time you were there. Yeah, it was like any war that anyone's ever been at or involved in, uh, there's a lot of bloodshedding, uh, a lot of problems, uh, burns, wounds. The MASH units worked wonders, but uh, the cases that were too severe for them, they would be shipped out to uh, General Hospital in Tokyo. They had a setup for veterans that were really shot up real bad, and they didn't have a lot of hope for them, except they got tried to save them, of course. They'd ship them off to uh, hospitals, and they call it the General Hospital. It was down right in Tokyo. It was a big military hospital. Guys went there. You know. How long? And then you went to the Philippines. How long were you in the Philippines? I was a two-year tour. Two-year tour? Yes. Uh, I ended up, by the time I got out of the service, I had uh, within two months of having total five years overseas duty. So, eh, it made me think a lot about this country and how great it is when you see some of the stuff they got over there and the way they have to live. There's no comparison to this country, none at all. They don't even stand a candle. I never went to Europe. I have no comparison with Europe, but I've heard a few complaints about Europe, so I don't want to get into that. I've never been there. Okay. And then you went to the Philippines. Uh, yes. What did you do in the Philippines? Well, same thing. I was an aircraft guy. I worked on the flight line. In fact, they put me in charge of a flight line. I worked out of uh, at Quants and Huts and stuff set up on the flight line for uh, manufacturing any parts you need and all the machines that do it and the equipment. And I had to make a morning report out every morning to uh, qualify for uh, the time the men were spending. Like if a job was going to take 20 hours, I'd have to write the report up every morning. So-and-so worked this job, estimated to be a 20-hour job, and he put in eight hours today. And the next day I'd have to, you know, keep up with that every day. And the COs, you turn them into the adjutant, actually, in the CO's office, and they'd go over some of that stuff. I'll never forget one time this CO of ours was a light colonel and <laughs> he happened to be a football coach too and I played on his team. <laughs> he called me up and he asked me, he says, how come you guys are holding up? I forgot the aircraft number, it's been too many years ago. Our aircraft so-and-so, it's, it's got to be back on flyable. I said, sir, I was joking with him. I said, I'm not holding it up, it's on jacks. I'm looking at it out the door now. <laughs> jacks are holding it up. He says, oh, wait till I see you. <laughs> Got some extra push-ups on the football field. <laughs> oh, how did you communicate with your uh, friends and family, or did you? Strictly you know? by post office mail. We had a, uh, you always call it headquarters. It was where the CEO done his business and the adjutant done all the business. Mostly the CO just told him what to do, <laughs> so the agent was the one with the shoulder responsibility. And you always had a mail clerk. It was usually a corporal or a sergeant, it was a mail clerk. And any time you left a mail off at headquarters, he'd make sure it got mailed on the next shipment out. Usually it was every day unless he was in a real bad zone. Uh, and mail call every day, he'd come out with his big duffel bag full of uh, mail and stand there and call your names off and whoever had mail would just go up and collect their mail. That was one of the big points of your day when you was over there, a mail call you wanted to hear from home. And did, packages especially. <laughs> who did you write the most? Uh, your family, like your mother and I wasn't married, I was single. My mother and my brothers kept touch with them. And mom, every once in a while, would send me a package of goodies and homemade cookies or whatever. You, you know, something good to eat anyways. And uh, the friends would be numerous at that point. I'd have more friends than I knew I had. Did mom write, did mom write you more or did you write mom more? No, 
I was bad. I got scolded more than once because of my lack of corresponding. So I, every time she, I felt sorry and I felt like I was abusing it, so then I would really get on the ball and start writing. So you, were, you said you were discharged in 1960. You're right. Okay, is that because you... Well, uh, I, I was actually asked to re-enlist, but I never did uh, because I knew my mother was in dire need of help because both my brothers were gone. I was the only one left, and I decided to come back and stay close. Were, were they happy to see you? Oh, very happy. I had a surprise party to knock your socks off, but uh, I survived it. My mother actually died living here in Riverview. She uh, moved out of Detroit, me and my wife, which was court administrator here in the city for a long time. Uh, we got, talked my mother into getting rid of her place and moving out here. She lived in those apartments on Forest Green, right on Fort Street mm -hmm. down there. Until she died, that's where she was at. Well, we already went over your kind of transition to civilian life, and yes. for you it was, um, very easy, which we'd already talked about, that, and you were very fortunate with that. Right. Now, the people that you were in the, the military with, do, do you still, are you still in contact with any, anybody that you served with? Uh, one of my friends from Lansing is the only one I have left that I keep in touch with. The rest that I had contacted with are all gone. Uh, I see him usually once a year, him and his wife, and my wife and myself. We do go out for lunch together because I go to Lansing with uh, the American Legion about once a year, and I get a hold of him. He lives in DeWitt, suburb of Lansing, and we get together. I know that you're involved in the uh, American Legion. And uh, how long have you been involved with the American Legion? Well, right now, over 20 years. Have you been involved with any other veterans organizations? A uh, long time ago, uh, in fact, when I was in Philippine Islands, there was a VFW post right on the base. I used to belong to that. But I haven't been with any other organizations since that because I have too much on my plate now. I got a lot I'm involved in, so to speak. So. Um. How do you think the service, being in the service in the military, impacted your life? Uh, done a great deal for me, I think, because uh, after all I've been through in the service and seen, I realized that this is the best country in the world. It makes you proud to be American, and you tend to grow up fast, and I really respect the service for, for all it taught me, really. What did it teach you? How to face up to what happens, what happens is going to happen, and you can't get out of it. Um, and the last question, uh, well, and it kind of goes into, if, if there was one thing you wanted to tell people that you learned from your military experience, what would it be? Uh, I think it's a good experience for a young man that can't make his mind up in my case, it was me. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I chose that way to start my life as a young adult. And then, uh, after I was in a while, I realized it was a good place to be, so I kept reenlisting. So, uh, I don't regret my choices. Uh, the only thing I regret is when I got all the service, and I really got a good job, but it was because of this service, helping build the right. Apollo. I, I regret the one thing. I got out of the service the first week. I got a check and I looked at it. I blinked twice. And that was more than I made in a month in the service as a staff sergeant. So that, that's the only thing I thought about civilian life I liked better. Yeah, but the military taught the, the exactly. military taught you the skills to get that paycheck. Exactly. I would have never been there hadn't I learned how to do that. You're exactly right. <laughs> How many children do you have, Mr. Hatfield? Yeah, well, I got two boys and a daughter. Uh, one child, 62-year-old, the oldest one, he died last year. Complications from a surgery he went through. But uh, the other ones are all healthy and good and got big families. Come to see Dad once in a while, too. 
I hope so. <laughs> did they did they all go to Riverview schools and grew up in Riverview? Every one of them grew up in this city, and uh, the two boys both went to Riverview High. My daughter uh, went to Christ the King Lutheran as a kid, uh, so when she grew up, she wanted to stay in a, but she didn't want to travel further for a Lutheran, so she ended up at Mount Carmel because it was a Christian school, and she uh, got her diploma from Mount Carmel and went to Michigan State. Graduated with honors, got her master's degree at University of Minnesota. Graduated with, she got hired before she even graduated with her high scores. And how many grandchildren do you have, Mr. Hatfield? Six, I want to say, but I'm probably missing some and I'll hear about it. Oh, that's okay. Once they see about it, then you'll hear about it. So, well, Mr. Hatfield, thank you very much for your service to our country. And I want to thank you very much for coming in today and doing this interview. And we'll have it on the website once we get it up. And, I'll, and oh, you know, right. I go to the meetings, and so I'll let you know yeah. when it happens. Yeah. All right? We got one. Okay. Coming up. So, yeah. so thank you very much. I appreciate thank you. it. You're this welcome. is the okay. moment. This is the day. When I send all my doubts and demons on their way. Every endeavor I have made ever.